Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues related to God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Howard G. Hendricks Center for Christian Leadership and Cultural Engagement. And our topic today is spousal abuse, and I have uh, two guests with me, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves so that uh, they can lay out their professional credentials and expertise that relates to this topic. And Gary, we'll start with you. Okay. Thank you, Daryl. <laughs> so I am a faculty member here with you at Dallas Seminary. I'm a uh, professor of the Biblical Counseling Program. I also have a part-time private practice. I'm a licensed psychologist and uh, specialize in marriage and family. All right. And I'm Debbie Wade, mm-hmm. and I am also a marriage and family therapist and a licensed professional counselor, and I specialize in working with intimacy issues and couples, marital work, but work with all ages, uh, children, teens, uh, women, and, and men. I have a private practice uh, that I founded in 1999 called ACT Solutions, which stands for Authentic Christian Therapeutic Solutions. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, Well, that's cool. I mean, I think of ACTS, I think of something else. So So that's great. Uh, Well, we're going to take a look and talk our way through as a way of working with the topic um, uh, a video that Gary has supplied that talks about spousal abuse. And I'm going to let Gary introduce the video, and then we're going to take a look at the first clip, and we're going to divide this up into five parts and and take a look at the issues that it raises and use that as kind of a launching point for what we're going to do. Yes. We, uh, right at the beginning, would want to say a very special word of thanks to the Faith and Trust Institute in Seattle, Washington, who's uh, given us permission to use their taping. Mm-hmm. And uh, we really want to commend their work to everyone, and they're a great resource. Uh, faithtrustinstitute.org would would be a great uh, website for them to follow up on. And so um, one of the uh, things that's really striking about the research on domestic violence is uh, four independent sociological studies Mm -hmm. looking at all different subgroups in our country have identified that conservative Protestant groups are the leading group where this is a problem. Wow. Now, what are, now you say there are four groups, so what would those other No, four of? different studies. Oh, four different studies. Looking okay. at other Christian groups as well as non-Christian groups. I see. <clears throat> now, uh, at the same time, uh, the other side of the coin is, is that conservative Protestant groups uh, would uh, be the, the people who would uh, be most against domestic violence. Hmm. And so this is a great secret Mm -hmm. that is really kept in our circle, Hmm. and it's one that, of all groups, we need to really pay special attention to. Well, my hope is is to talk our way through this and also give people practical advice uh, if they are in such a situation, or perhaps perhaps also, just as importantly, if they know someone who's in such a situation. Mm-hmm. So um, so we'll do that as we proceed through mm-hmm. the video. So we'll take a look here at the first clip, which introduces some statistics and also introduces us uh, to uh, the person who is the focus of the video. Okay. Once very early, in one of the first few times, he uh, gave me a black eye and he bloodied my nose. And after that, he realized he didn't want me to having to explain to people why I had a black eye or something like that. He always hit me where it wouldn't show. A U.S. survey indicates that violence has occurred in 28% of all marriages. Researchers believe this figure is low since most domestic violence incidents go unreported. Abuse can happen in any adult intimate relationship, but in 95% of all domestic violence cases, the assaults are committed by men against women. He was a Baptist, and I started going to church with him. So I became a Christian just about the same time that I married. I really wanted to start a new life, and I identified very strongly with the evangelical values that I encountered in the church. I wanted to be a good Christian wife. Janet and her husband were college sweethearts who went on to become highly successful adults. He was a prominent community leader. She was recognized for her work as a college professor. 
No one in their church knew their family secret. The first time there was physical violence, I felt like it was my fault. I felt like um, I just wasn't being a good enough wife and so forth. And I really thought it would never happen again. Domestic violence or wife abuse is really a, a pattern of abuse. It's a pattern of behavior. It consists of physical assaults, psychological assaults, attacks against property and pets, sexual assaults. I have just found myself tremendously isolated. He was very concerned about saving money, controlling finances, and so, in fact, he didn't even want me to do the grocery shopping. All right. Well, that's the opening story. How common is it um, that uh, that people that people think they can, uh, I would say, get away with spousal abuse? Uh, how how common is it that it, it is kept secret? I, I would. I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm stumbling a minute okay. in responding to that. I think it's fairly common that because of the shame and the guilt that's there, mm -hmm. that the victim would feel too much fear mm -hmm. uh, to share. And I think that when the batterer, or whether it's physical or uh, psychological abuser, with the control that they have, I think they feel fairly confident mm -hmm. that the one that they are battering will not um, tell the secret. I think they come back and um, – use other tactics mm -hmm. uh, to control that are nice and loving, or they appear to be nice and loving, mm -hmm. but done in a way that's very controlling. And so I think I think the abuser feels very confident that they can control uh, the the victim from telling. Now, there's the key word here is the word control. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, ta let's talk about that. What mm -hmm. exactly is going on when this type of situation is taking place? You know, a lot of uh, people who – are just kind of maybe thinking about this for the first time and hasn't mm -hmm. been a part of their experience. They they might think that oh this is just like out of control anger, mm -hmm. and this is a very very different problem than that. There that is a problem as well, mm -hmm. but this is a distinct. This is actually all about control. Mm -hmm. It's not about being out of control. Okay, it's very calculated. It even is intermixed with. Positive things like bringing flowers home uh, and and being nice, kind of a honeymoon period, which then will flip, and then it's about being abusive. And it's uh, but the abuse is is about controlling. It's it's about keeping one subject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the 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 violence is a means by which um, by which one manages the the relationship. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Totally, and and so that's why that twenty eight percent statistic is most likely a very low number mm -hmm. because so much of this will will go unreported. Okay, so we've got on the one hand this this theme of this usually is kept um, under wraps, and on the other hand, it also uh, it also is about control. So th this leads us into, in, into thinking through how, um, how spousal abuse kind of works itself out. So let's go to the next clip and see, uh, see what, uh, what, it, what is coming at us mm -hmm. next. Yeah. It's a pattern of control. Controlling the person's activities, who she sees, where she goes, uh, who she relates to, her contact with family. And I would be walking on eggshells trying to avoid doing anything that would upset him. And this would go on for weeks. And then finally something would trigger an explosion. And so it, sometimes it was just a few blows or a kick. A subtle form of abuse, like a particular look or a particular gesture, is building on the more overt forms, which is the physical violence. If I resisted or was angry or answered back or anything like that, then it would be a lot more. And so I learned not to do that. One of the myths is that domestic violence is conflict run amok, that it's really about someone getting angry and losing control, when just the opposite is true, that domestic violence is an issue of power and control. But I just would want to get it over with, and then he would retire to bed, and he always seemed to go right to sleep and sleep just fine. 
abusers use uh, domestic violence or use these tactics of control when they're not angry, but when they want to get something, when they want to get their own way in those relationships. Um, and then he would sort of forgive me, and then we would have a couple of weeks where I felt like life was almost bearable. I mean, he would be nice to me. That the so-called honeymoon stage is really not a honeymoon stage, but merely the abuser has shifted tactics. Rather than using his fists, he is now using flowers or sweet words in order to control the victim, in order to get her to comply. Mm. Okay, that's about the mm -hmm. way in which control works. I do have a question that I think uh, should be raised here at the start, and that is, when we talk about spousal abuse, how should we actually define it? Does it have to be physical? The reason mm -hmm. I raise the question is, is that the psychologist in the piece said, you know, sometimes it's a look. Yes. Uh, now I sit right. there and I go, Okay, I've done that. <laughs> Am I an abuser? Uh, so, so let's talk about defining what it is that we're mm -hmm. talking about. What, is, what exactly do we mean? And are we dealing with a spectrum? Uh, what, what's, right, what's going right. on here? Yeah, certainly. Uh, much abuse can just be psychological and emotional. Uh, you know, I think as she was talking about, if she showed anger or showed any sort of emotional response, he controlled it with either a look or maybe his behavior or a certain stance, even maybe without hitting her. And so I think when we think of psychological and emotional abuse, it is done in such a way that, the again, the victim uh, can't have a sense of self, mm -hmm. that they have to give up their self to be whoever it is that the abuser is controlling them to be. Mm -hmm. And so I think many women, uh, when, when they've come in and they're crushed and have no idea of their own identity, mm -hmm. it, it's often that they're in a psychologically or emotionally abusive situation. So we shouldn't think of this, even though we can talk about domestic violence or spousal abuse, in some ways spousal abuse may be a better term than domestic violence because we would think, well, if it's not violent, then it's not abuse. That would be, yeah, a very misleading way of thinking about it. If, if it's only physical abuse, then anything else is okay, and that's totally wrong. Yeah. Now, I think the background here, probably a good point to bring in a little bit of the Bible, uh, mm -hmm. is to think about what uh, spousal responsibilities are in marriage. And of course, the spousal responsibilities that the Scripture lays out is that these are two people who are supposed to love one another, nurture one another. Mm -hmm. Certainly there's a major responsibility on the part of the husband in the house in Ephesians 5 and mm -hmm. texts like this mm -hmm. for the husband to be – to care for the wife as Christ does for the church, right. so there is a nurturing and a supportive element. Mm -hmm. So this abuse obviously runs smack dab into into, into that kind of modeling. Is that is that? Yeah, right? this is this is actually totally contrary to the heart of God on relationships, mm -hmm. and and I would see that the the big theme there would be relationships of those who are followers of Christ, mm -hmm. unlike those. The Gentiles, or those who aren't the followers of Christ, right, is characterized by a oneness that's not based in sameness. Mm -hmm. See, and what did Paul say about the Gentiles? When they bump into their conflicts and problems, they lord it over one another. Mm -hmm. See, there's the use of self-serving power mm -hmm. that he says is not to be a part of those relationships mm -hmm. for people who are followers of Christ. Mm -hmm. And, and so there's this sense of mutuality, of submitting one to another out of reverence to Christ, in mm -hmm. Ephesians 5.21, that really sets the whole tone before we get into the distinct and separate roles and responsibilities. So, so rather than having a model that's, hi that's highlighting power and control, where one person's controlling the other, we really have a mutuality and service that's supposed to be mm -hmm. going on that's helping people grow as people in the context of their marriage relationship. I mean, we tend to view marriage sometimes as a as a know, as a social context or something like that or maybe a, a, in a utilitarian kind of way of meeting my needs. But actually marriage is much more profound than that, isn't it? 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, what I find is interesting is that passage that y'all were just speaking of, Ephesians 5, I think 21 through about 33 Mm -hmm. is where it's talking about marriage. That's, I think, often the the most misused uh, scripture Mm -hmm. on men being the headship of the wife, but it being interpreted in a very uh, wrong way. Because the term submission is in the passage. Yes, Uh and that the husband should be the headship. Mm -hmm. And so I believe often maybe even churches unknowingly support a woman staying in an abusive marriage based on that passage right and and the husband often feel justified not recognizing the distortion right that has uh, they've taken the message and distorted in such a way you know i have students do an exercise when i teach ephesians and what i do is i have them take a sheet of paper and on one side i have them put a column for power and on the other side i have them put a column for service mm. and i have them list all the times power is evoked in that passage and all the wow. times images of service mm. are evoked in that passage, and I give them about five minutes to read through the passage and make the list. And when it's all done, it's interesting because the best you can do on the power side, the best you can do is to put the term head right in there, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Everything else is on the service or nurturing or caring side of the equation. And to which my point becomes well, if Head is the only thing that goes on the power side, but everything else is defining service and care and nurturing, Mm -hmm. then maybe the headship is about service and care and nurturing Mm -hmm. as well. And so we shouldn't read it as a power as a power play at all. And so the the way the entire passage is framed Mm -hmm. uh, helps us to understand what's going on in that passage. Yeah, I'd say the two big correctives on that is is Head shouldn't be on the power side in terms of negative power. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it should be on the power side in terms of positive power. Right, and and that's the other corrective is that there's nothing more powerful than love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See, but it's it's not a self-serving power. Right, right. which is so, why the a- image of Jesus's sacrifice is that's raised right. in the passage because that is the door through which you're walking. I, I think we're talking about the main reason why the Protestant group has the greatest frequency of occurrence of spousal mm-hmm. abuse, and that's because this this becomes ammo, this use of the term head mm-hmm. uh, becomes ammo for living like the Gentiles do. This is my ticket mm-hmm. for having you be controlled by me, mm-hmm. right? See, and therefore your role is to let me control you. So it's not only spousal abuse. I'm gonna have a little fun here. It's not only spousal abuse, but it's abuse of the concept of headship. That's right. Yes, uh, in a serious kind of way, and so uh, and it and it is a complete, as we've said, distortion of what that passage is driving for. If the picture is Christ sacrificing Himself, uh, being our Savior, nurturing and caring, uh, that's one element of it. The, Another picture I like to use, since we're still talking biblically, uh, is the picture of oneness. Mm-hmm. And I like to say to couples, I do this in, in what little premarital counseling I do, mm-hmm. uh, I'll say to them, you know, God has made you into one. Well, what that means is, is that when you're having those famous marital discussions mm-hmm. where there's not unity about what's to be done, that when your spouse is speaking to you, you should hear it like it's your own voice talking. That they're a part of you and you're a part of them. Mm -hmm. And so even though it's coming at you from an angle you may not expect, the the respect and the attention that you give to it is if you're speaking uh, as a part of yourself because in God's eyes you are a unit and you need to think of yourself that Mm way. Mm -hmm. Is that a a helpful way to think about this? Yeah, I think in terms of there is a us, that's the one. Right. The us. Right. It's not like the joke uh, during the wedding ceremony when the when the minister says and and the two shall be one and then the one guy leans over to the other guy but he's sitting in the audience and says yeah but which one? Yeah. Right. Right. See, it's it's not where one disappears. That's right. For the other. Right. So that they can be one. Right. So that's it's it's two whole people. Mm-hmm. Two separate identities, distinct, mm-hmm. making choices together that cultivates the third identity of the us. Mm-hmm. And in uh, spousal abuse situations, that's not the working model. 
Okay, the, the one person's being completely suppressed. That's exactly well, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, um, uh, Debbie, let me ask you from a, uh, from a from the female point of view, because it said ninety five percent of these situations are males against females, unless we're dealing with an Amazon mm-hmm. marriage. We we aren't uh-huh. uh, we aren't dealing with a woman, generally speaking, doing this to a man. Uh, what what do you tend to see when someone comes in in this kind of situation from the female perspective? What do you, what when the happened? female's the victim, right? Yeah, typically, like I said, worn out, exhausted, uh, feeling that they have no sense of worth, mm-hmm. no sense of self, uh, questions uh, whether they have anything to offer or a value, and then scared to death to even in my office to be sharing mm-hmm. uh, for fear that if anything were to come out, that then the abuse would get worse. Uh, fear of being able to leave it because they've been made to feel that they cannot make it on their own. Right. And then I think a, another term that I uh, or statement that often is quoted, the abuser will often say, "No one will love you as good as I love you," hmm. Hmm. and they will believe that. Hmm. And so then, if this is me being loved as good as I'm going to get loved, right. then how could I survive out there and be loved any less, right, or any worse? And um, so th- there's that real uh, mental and emotional damage that's done uh, to the soul and to the spirit as well. And so one of the factors that, that comes into this as the person is wrestling with this is, is just the, the, f- the fear of the unknown of pulling out or creating some distance in the situation just to get your hands around it, which can be very, very difficult because mm-hmm. the person can feel like they're going to be isolated and on their own and not able – to, uh, to deal with this, and in some states where where laws very much favor uh, the husband in the relationship, I don't know how else to put it. Uh, I've, um, I have a relative. I've had several relatives who've gone through divorce, but one in particular where I'm thinking of where the where uh, it, the spouse was a wife who who uh, had opted out of a, a situation involving alcohol abuse, and um, and the difficulty of of being willing to create that distance mm-hmm. because of the uncertainty of what's mm-hmm. on the other side mm-hmm. also it becomes a holding uh, element that creates a holding pattern in the relationship. It's, that's that exactly common? right. Yeah. And that's all part of the control mechanism mm-hmm. is to uh, lead the other spouse to believe that things would be worse. Mm-hmm. Right. If they if they try to move outside of this relationship, yeah. okay. Well, the next and, pe- go ahead. Can, can no, I jump yeah, in real sure, quick? Hey. I I have worked with a couple of couples that it has been the man who's mm-hmm. been the victim, hmm. and in some ways that has even been more difficult because how many men stand up and, and go, "Yeah, I'm being beaten up yeah. and raged at by my wife." Mm-hmm. To be believed in as the victim, it's right. kind of like, yeah, well, what are you causing to, you know, yeah. to cause her to do that? Or surely you can stop that. Uh-huh. Uh, and they've had to resort to calling the police. Wow. And it's only when police are willing to put the woman in handcuffs and take them away is when the men are validated of, okay, I really was abused. Now that raises an interesting situation. <laughs> when I was a student at SMU, I had to. One of our assignments in one of our classes, it was a counseling class actually, was uh, was to ride with the police for a day mm-hmm. and see what they go through. Right. And what I saw were police who were really, really hesitant to walk into domestic uh, violence situations oh, yeah. and intervene. So that even though in some cases they knew, I and mean, it was repeated, I mean, they knew this was a house where, mm-hmm. where things were a mess. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm sure with a counseling standpoint, you all have contact with, with – Police on a regular mm-hmm. basis in these kinds of situations. What kind of limitations are they operating under? Well, you know, I have a, a buddy who's a career police officer, and, he, and he'll say right up front, the, the last thing I ever want to walk into is a domestic violence situation. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Because when you get in the middle of that, you, you, it's so unpredictable, and you have two enemies coming at you from both directions. And mm. so uh, they, they really have a difficult task. To try to step in and intervene. In yeah, the and it, of it it actually does have to be pretty pretty threatening before they'll even uh, opt to do anything. Mm-hmm. Is that is that oh, all yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's look at the, we're we're talking about violence now. I think the next uh, section we're going to look at is going to discuss this. The roles that men are supposed to uh, fill in our society are, are really a setup for violence. We are taught that uh, a we should get our way. 
and it be uh, that if we don't get our way that we can either threaten people, push them around, or hurt them in any way that's necessary to, uh, to get our way. And in fact, that if we're not willing uh, to uh, do that on an as-needed basis, that we're not real men. And I had no sense of my basic human rights because I was married. I, later I thought, what was I thinking if a stranger had come up on the street and slugged me in the stomach or kicked me? I wouldn't have hesitated to call the police. It was because we live in a society that um, uh, accepts on a deep and uh, uh, subconscious level that women are the property of men. And when we say you may not, under any circumstances, for any excuse, beat your wife or girlfriend or any woman, uh, we are challenging those property rights. But as soon as I moved out and said I wanted a separation and would not come home, he immediately went to my pastor and the church board. They couldn't understand why I couldn't go back in a period of reconciliation. You know, since my former husband appeared to be so desperate to have me come home, surely I could go back for a while. How bad could it be? And that's when I began to wonder if they even heard me. Wow. Mm. Oh, well, this raises a whole series mm -hmm. of questions. We've got the issue mm -hmm. of violence on the one hand. We've got what do you do when you hear about this situation? And then we've got the movement towards a kind of separation to create, a, a at, at best, a cooling off situation mm -hmm. where you can deal with this. So let's deal with them in order. We've talked already a little bit about the violence, but the idea of, of the right that some people feel to control um, – isn't one of the more difficult things uh, uh, unraveling why a person wants to have so much control in a relationship uh, and and to the extent of of suppressing uh, the personhood of the person that they're that they supposedly care about right I don't know what you find, uh, Dr. Barnes, but I, I know that typically for most of the ones that I have worked with, there's fear and insecurity that are there. And so the male feels so threatened. And although he's the intimidating, the mean, the squatching one in, inside, he's really the one that struggles with feeling insecure and fear. And that motivates his need to control everything, almost like if I'm not controlling it, it won't happen the way I want. Or if I'm not controlling it, she may get closer to other people. Or if I don't control the people she's around, she may like them better than me. Uh, but but such a, a sense of fear mm -hmm. that kind of feeds what he was saying, that need that I should be able to control this and it's my right to control it. Yeah, the irony here is that the person is <clears throat> the person who's controlling is really manifesting incredible weakness. Yes. And incredible yeah. insecurity. Mm -hmm. And and I think there's a great sense of um being hopeless or helpless themselves, mm -hmm. see, that, that really drives this sense of I really need to be in control here, mm -hmm. and I'll, whatever means is necessary is actually justified. So unraveling that, it seems to me, from a counseling standpoint, is, uh, has got to be a very uh, complex and long-term Mm -hmm. uh, operation. Fair? The, like I say, this is not just um, negative emotions of anger that are out of control. This is deep-seated, important uh, places for them to get awareness of that aren't, aren't going to be a quick and easy awareness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the violence part of it and the and the, the abuser part of it. Let's take a look at this. Uh, at this, what do you do? The practical question: What do you do? Either if you're in a situation, probably that's one scenario, or if you know someone who's in this situation. Let's let's start first with in the situation. And I suspect that one of the things that you're going to say very, very quickly is don't keep it a secret. Try and get help in one way or another. Is that it, totally this? That's the thing that perpetuates the whole problem is the secrecy. Uh, or this sense of this is uh, normal mm -hmm. or this is justified, mm -hmm. or in many cases the victim a actually is led to believe that I am the problem mm -hmm. and, and it, this is all because of me that this is happening. See? So that has to be 
brought out into the open and bright lights shined on that. So uh, that's to uh, – does it make any difference where you go, or do you think, or, or have, what kind of advice – I mean, the, 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 I would imagine that the way in which this might start for someone who's timid about coming forward is, you know, they don't run to a counselor, they don't run to a pastor, mm-hmm. but they might tell a friend. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and that may or may not be good enough depending on how that's done. Right. Fair enough? Right. And I think each case may be different. Mm-hmm. You know, so, some people have some really good solid friends that are going to be heard and trusted and they the friend could even provide maybe a, a shelter in their home that mm-hmm. they could come and have a place to go. I think if an abuser, though, has the victim so controlled that they really don't have any close friends, mm-hmm. the next best option if they're associated with the church is going to someone on staff at the church, I would think, to just say, this is what's happening in my home. And I know it doesn't look like it from the outside, but this is what's happening in my home, and it's very scary. It doesn't feel like a safe place to be. Um, I think also there's times when absolutely counselors are going to be needed to help with that reconciliation process if it can even be done. Now that raises a, mm-hmm. a, a good another good practical question, and that is the interface that happens between churches and counselors, because mm-hmm. sometimes churches mm-hmm. don't have their own internal counseling, and sometimes a, a pastor may or may not feel qualified when someone walks into their office and shares something like this, mm-hmm. be, f- feel comfortable or qualified to deal with this, or the tricky part of it may be a person may think they're qualified to deal with this, but they may really not be. Right. And so right. uh, they may not – they may bring more harm than good mm-hmm. to the situation. So what advice would you give to pastors and pastoral staffs about how to make the judgment about how involved they should be? Because this looks to me to be – once these situations emerge, they're, they are – a counselor intensive, if I can mm-hmm. say it that way. Mm-hmm. This is not something that you have one or two talks That's and right. it's done. Uh, this is going to take multiple um, uh, get-togethers to kind of right. sort your way through. So what advice My, would you my give? big encouragement uh, for uh, all of those listening who would be in church leadership roles would be that you don't see or hear what we're talking about today and, and see this as something that you just refer and and you don't continue to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. So that that would actually contribute to the mm-hmm. problem of of the person being isolated from the needed support mm-hmm. system. Mm-hmm. So uh, they would surely need to have the the right professional care, mm-hmm. but they really need to have their church community come around them in a loving way, modeling the opposite kind of submitting one to another mm-hmm. out of mm-hmm. reverence to Christ. Mm-hmm. And and so. Um, I would love for churches to actually take more initiative in this area. Uh, and and the way that they can do that is, is to uh, even have um, awareness building in, mm-hmm. within their own church community, mm. maybe even a particular Sunday or, mm. or a month or something, where they're having uh, local shelter leaders come in and mm. help uh, provide information and education. and. And uh, that we can realize that just because we don't see this visually as a problem doesn't mean it doesn't exist within our circle. Mm-hmm. See, mm-hmm. and and so um, to give people kind of permission to begin to talk about it mm-hmm. is, is very very important. And and then um, someone who may be very fearful of mentioning it might just have that much encouragement to to share it. Now, how how would you create that environment? In other words, the environment of, of in a church that says we're willing to talk about this. How how what steps practical steps could someone uh, have to do to do that? Well, I think the church should be, of all people, uh, groups leading the way on on correct biblical teaching Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, about submission and headship. Uh, So um, there needs to that that is just like a first step. We got to do that, right? Okay, and then that can pave the way for okay. So, what other things should we also learn uh, related to this? Mm And then uh, bringing in other mental health professionals or, or people from local shelters uh, would be great ways of um, having people just increase the dialogue. 
So that that's going to involve obviously the way even you illustrate and talk about the passage, the type of scenarios that you talk about when you're yeah. talking about headship or abuse of headship. Mm-hmm. But that also is going to involve maybe uh, a topical study looking at at the issues of marriage and family in which this is a component mm-hmm. that you talk about. Mm-hmm. You let people know uh, who they can contact and where the help is mm-hmm. available. That kind of thing. I mean, it seems to me you've got to to uh, to. I don't know what other word to use. You almost got to have to push people um, to mm-hmm. walk into this area right. because the because of the hesitation of going there, mm-hmm. without I mean without shoving them. But I mean mm-hmm. there. But there does need to be an acknowledgement and openness that that this is something that should be pursued. And and uh, the other big thing, Daryl, that I think the church needs to be stronger on is the redemptive message of Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and this is a real life situation that mm-hmm. Christ can be redemptive in. Hmm. Think about it. If if we have twenty eight percent of marriages mm-hmm. that are experiencing mm-hmm. this, and that's most likely underreported, right? Mm-hmm. And if Protestant churches are the leading group of all of the subgroups mm-hmm. <laughs> where this is characteristic of. Within your church, you're going to have one out of four to one out of three people. In fact, who could the be experiencing is this. That the person, someone on the pew that you sit on. That's right. Yeah. And, and we're speaking of the spouses, and then that's not including the children that are impacted mm-hmm. by this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I did work with one family uh, that the church that they were attending at the time, um, the, the woman was being abused uh, so mentally and emotionally. Mm-hmm. And uh, somewhat physically, mm-hmm. uh, never anything broken or blackened or anything, but a, a lot of roughness. Mm-hmm. And then she felt that the dad was doing sexually inappropriate things with the girls preg- present. Mm. Well, the church that she was attending at the time when she went, uh, the staff really did not support her, did mm. not support, believe that this was going on, and really did not support her moving out of the house and getting the kids safety. But she had a friend that was willing to let her uh, do that. The friend gave her my name, got got the girls into counseling, got her into counseling. And then I made some recommendations of some other churches, and she got plugged into a women's group. And these women came around her and supported her. Um, they knew that she needed uh, the girls needed clothes. They knew that she needed a vehicle. Hmm. And among this group of Bible study women, they provide ended up providing a car for her because it, I mean when she left the, the because the church did not support her, they encouraged the the man really to let her leave with nothing, hmm. and so she left with nothing. And so this other church came alongside and really loved them mm-hmm. uh, so much so that as these girls grew up, the uh, when one of the girls became a teenager ended up uh, doing an internship hmm. with this other with this church. Hmm. So some churches really are learning how to come alongside and support and and love and, and bring in so, the servantship of Christ, being true servants of one another, intending to one another. And it, to me, then the the blessing and the the redeeming, uh, everybody gets to experience. Mm-hmm. This. Join us next week for part two of The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.